Okay, we about ready to start here. Okay, this is the John Riley Project, and we're going to be discussing Fry's Electronics and Capitalism today. So this should be kind of a fun discussion. And But before I can really get into it, I mean, let's talk about the elephant in the room, right? And that's Tiger Woods. And the whole Tiger Woods thing's been in the news, and I just want to make a couple of comments right off the top. But, um, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I caught mention of the whole Tiger Woods accident, you know, terrible accident he was in, in Rancho Palos Verdes. And it was, I think I saw the first mention of it on Twitter. And what did I do? I flipped the channel and I checked out CNN yesterday afternoon. And it was like wall to wall Tiger Woods. I mean, it was like, remember when they had that plane crash, the plane that disappeared in the South Pacific or the Indian Ocean about five, six years ago. I remember CNN was just on it. 24 seven. And that's what it was, the, the Tiger Woods story was like that. And it was incredible. And they were bringing in guests and they were going over his career. And it was almost like they, that he died, <laughs> that it was like an obituary, but you know, it was just nonstop coverage of Tiger. And I don't know, I must've seen video of his wrecked car, like 3 million and two times in, in a 30 minute slice of, of time. I mean, it was unbelievable, but you know, it, it is interesting. I mean, you watch the news, you watch the mainstream media, and um, it's you just realize that it's all about ratings for them, right? I mean, this is the cable news network, CNN. I know they get a lot of crap these days, especially from our conservative friends, but really all the media is like this. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's left or right. It's all about ratings, right? I mean, it's a business and they're trying to get eyeballs and the more eyeballs they have, the more they can sell their advertising time for that makes sense. But, you know, it's just it's hard to get serious journalism from cable news. And for me, I've largely turned it off. I don't I rarely watch it, except maybe in the morning. I might watch MSNBC for just a little bit, mostly to have on in the background. But it's amazing how like a lot a lot of the more serious news is just really you got to go elsewhere for it. And it's typically not on television. You got to find the real content online. Uh, Pete Neal on the podcast chimes in. Tiger Woods get gets more press coverage from his screw ups than his golf game. Oh yeah, probably. But the reason he does get a lot of coverage of his screw ups is because his golf game is so great. I mean, if he wasn't a, a great golfer, he was one of the all time greats. No one would care, you know, that he, you know, had had trouble in his personal life. But it is interesting too. And I, I, I was having a conversation, Pete and I were talking about this. I think it was yesterday or maybe it was Monday. No, it was Monday. And um, we were just talking about news media and how news media, you know, really I've always contended all news media is biased, right? There's no such news media that is pure, that is balanced, that is, um, that is covering all bases of any given story. I mean, all media is biased, whether intentional, like, like Fox News or MSNBC that sh that skews it right wing or left wing, or it may be biased simply not by what they say, but what they choose not to say. Um, you know, they may present that they're showing both sides of a story, but a lot of times there are more than two sides of a story. There could be three or four or five sides of a story, and those other sides may not even be covered at all. And a lot of times media is biased because of what they unconsciously or unintentionally leave out. So it's just, it's an interesting topic to talk about media. And, you know, I, I often say, try to get as much of your information from as many media sources as possible from the broadest range of news sources possible, and then distill the truth yourself. Uh, Cause I think that's when we can really truly understand what's going on is when you can integrate all these different points of view. And again, Pete and I, we were talking about, Pete put together this great video and this will probably be a subject of a future podcast and you know, probably in the near future, talking about how different people see the same thing from different points of view, but their reality will be very different. You know, the, multiple people will see the same thing, but to them, it comes across as something very different. It's a fascinating topic, and uh, Pete actually demonstrated it in one of his videos. We'll probably talk about it within the context of current events and news, and I think it's an interesting topic. Um, 
Pete goes on to say, and they never let me know when he blew the apex or the apogee. Yeah. So my friends and I, we were talking about the Tiger Woods thing and, you know, what happened, you know, was he, was he drunk? I mean, but it was like, what, it was like in the morning, wasn't it? Like, I don't know what time it happened, maybe nine in the morning, something like that. It was, it was so you probably wasn't drunk, but you know, was he taking prescription medic medication and did that screw him up? And that's possible. I mean, because he's, you know, been rehabbing and he's had back surgeries and, you know, he's had some wear and tear on his body, no doubt about it. So it could have been that. And then over the weekend, I was watching the golf tournament, the, you know, the Genesis tournament that was up at Riviera up in LA with my son. And just side note, I was trying to confirm where that golf course was. And I thought, said to myself, I think it's in Brentwood. And sure enough, it is in good old Brentwood, the, the stomping grounds of OJ Simpson. Um, but you know, he was on Tiger Woods was being interviewed by Jim Nance and my friends and I were talking, you know, we were swapping emails and we were commenting about how Woods looked kind of like puffy faced and kind of a little bit slow. And, you know, was he, was he on meds? I mean, legitimately, was he on medication for pain because of his surgery or, you know, did he, you know, he was in LA visiting uh, for the tournament, but because he lives in Florida, but he was in LA. Did he hook up with some of his friends and, and have a late night the night before? I mean, we didn't know. So it was interesting. Just it's fun to speculate on this sort of thing. But um, one of my friends brought up a really interesting point because we were talking about how in one of the news stories, Woods, apparently he was at, I don't know where he was in the morning just prior to the accident, but apparently he was really angry and, and he had gotten in his car. It was one of the Genesis invitational cars from the golf tournament that weekend. And I guess he peeled out in the parking lot and he was really upset. He was kind of aggro. And so that was one of the theories is he was just driving too fast because he was angry. Maybe he was on his phone talking and, and, and I looked it up. I mean, cause it was, um, what was the name of the street? Was it Torrance Boulevard or, or something like that? And I was thinking to myself, does that actually go through Rancho Palos Verdes? And I looked it up on Google maps and sure enough, it does. And it's kind of a windy road through there. So you know, if he was gassing it and maybe not focused on the road for any number of reasons, yeah, that accident, I mean, it could have been us, you know, any one of us could be in an accident like that if we're not being careful on the road. But my buddy was commenting about how it's interesting. Yeah. It could have been aggro, you know, he could have been upset and people have accused Tiger of being like a narcissist. But then my friend said that, you know, for a lot of people, a lot of really successful people, that are obsessed with being innovators in their business or being trailblazers or, you know, being on top. A lot of them are narcissists and sometimes it goes hand in hand with it. And so, you know, being the greatest of all time, being a goat sometimes is a double-edged sword because it takes unbelievable personal focus to get there. And then it, sometimes it has some interesting side effects. So I don't know. I'm a big Tiger Woods fan. I always have been from the very beginning. I mean, because, you know, first of all, when he broke in, he was a young man. I think he was a teenager when he went pro. And then he went pro, I think, in 96. And then in 97, he won the Masters, which was unbelievable. And, you know, after he won the green jacket and, you know, for the green jacket winner, it's a, they have a ceremony. And and then I think, is it that night or is it the following year, right before the tournament starts? There's some deal where the tournament champion gets to decide the dinner that's going to be served to the players and to the staff that are at the masters and fuzzy Zeller, who, you know, was a big time golfer in the eighties and nineties. He was interviewed and was, was commenting about tiger woods winning the masters in 1997. I think he was like 19 years old or 18. It was unbelievable. And fuzzy Zeller, you know, said, Oh yeah, the kid was good. And he, he has the skills and the talent and then he made a racist comment afterwards. And he said, yeah, well, you know, when they have the dinner, you know, maybe they'll serve fried chicken and collard greens. And I'm like, oh, my God. So the fact that Woods has not only been a champion, not only been a champion at a young age, but he broke through this color barrier that was prevalent in this country club set, you know, in the PGA. I mean, he won the Masters in 97. And I don't think. You know, I learned this from watching some of the 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 um, interviews. Like Bob Costas was was 
talking about Tiger Woods in one of the CNN interviews. And he said that even though he won the Masters in 97, the the Augusta Country Club there where the where the tournament's held, I don't think they began admitting black members until 1990. So to me, I mean, Tiger Woods to me is a guy that I'm always going to root for. I mean, I'm going to root for him when he's on the course, you know, and a lot of people are. Anytime Tiger is in the hunt on Sunday, everyone goes bananas. I love Tiger Woods, and I, 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 he's a guy that is just fun to root for. You know, and there's like a little bit of a SoCal connection, and I know Tiger, Tory Pines is like one of his courses he grew up on in youth golf. So there's that local connection too, which makes it cool. But, you know, the guy's a champion. He's singularly focused on golf, and I think I'm going to talk a little bit about that. The singular focus and being a specialist is one way to really get ahead in the world. And, and he's obviously taken a specialty and been damn good at it. And it is cashed in for him, but yeah, he's an innovator. He's a trailblazer. He, he was responsible really for making golf a huge industry in the two thousands started to wane a little bit in the 20 teens, but now with COVID golf is back on the upswing and, and that's great. You know, it's, it's good for the industry. It's good for the fans. It's, and it's fun, you know, for the fans to follow the sport. And a lot of us are following it because of Tiger Woods. I mean, the day before, I, or maybe a few days before his accident, he was out golfing with um, uh, Dwayne Wade, you know, NBA star Dwayne Wade. He's retired now. But Wade said that the reason he got into golf was because of Tiger Woods. I mean, he never would have considered golfing. Um, but now, so it brings in the new generation. It brings in new demographics, new people into the sport. And I, I just, I think he's terrific and he's overcome all these challenges. Now in the beginning, you know, the challenge of course was youth. The challenge was race, but now, you know, he's gone through these personal problems with his marriage and, you know, infidelity and all kinds of crazy stories. And, you know, whether you agree or disagree with the crazy stories and the things he's gone through, he has created his own new challenges. And so when he rose up again and did he win, I think it was the masters a couple of years ago, he came back and won it. It was just awesome. So he like climbed the mountain, got knocked down to the bottom of the hill and he climbed the mountain again. So now what's going to happen? I mean, you know, he's had suffered some terrible injuries. Is he going to be able to resume his career? And is he going to be able to, to actually beat Jack Nicholas's record of the most major championships? I'm rooting for him. Um, you know, we're going to find out what actually went down with this accident. Hopefully it wasn't anything that was, that would tarnish his reputation, but maybe it was just an accident. Like, like you or I, an innocent accident could have been that, but we're going to find out. But I just want to let you know, I'm a big Tiger Woods fan. I'm, I'm rooting for him, wishing him the best. Um, so, you know, I'm doing this podcast and I'm trying to do it like every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at two, and I'm live streaming on YouTube and Facebook. You know, of course we welcome your thoughts and comments and questions, just type them in and I'll, I'll read them all on the air as long as it's not something crazy. Uh, and we'll have some fun. We have some dialogue and, and we'll make this enjoyable, but you know, I, I'm, I'm going to talk about Fry's electronics and capitalism. But before I do, you know, when I'm doing this podcast, it's, it's actually it takes me a lot of effort to come up with what am I going to talk about? And in the beginning, you know, when I started this podcast, I was interviewing guests and then I just have to do some research and put together a few questions. And, and then it's easy. You know, the guest fills in a lot of the time and the space, but when I'm doing these solo, I've got to basically do the whole thing by myself. And so I've got to do some research. I got to figure out what to talk about and, you know, some topics are better than others and some podcasts have been better than others. But sometimes I, I think, oh my God, what am I going to talk about today? But then I used to look around. I mean, there's just so much to discuss. And, you know, I typically like to talk about the economy or politics or culture, I like to talk about entrepreneurism and business, but I'm always still trying to weave into these solo podcasts lessons that we can learn, you know, nuggets we can take away on how to be better people, whether we're better on an individual basis with our own, you know, psyche, our own, our own self-improvement course, you know, if you will. And we, we talked a little bit about that in our flow charts in the mind podcast, particularly the one on Friday, but there are also, um, 
you know, opportunities that I think we can take away to, to make ourselves better in business, to make ourselves better personally, you know, character, integrity, and the like. So I'm going to try to weave some of that in today. But, you know, I was thinking well, we could talk about high school sports are coming back and I'm looking forward to that. I mean, actually two years ago, I was doing play-by-play -play on the live stream on Facebook for Poway High School baseball. And that was a ton of fun. And I was going to do it again in 2019. And then the season got canceled or excuse me, in 2020, I was going to do it again, but the season got canceled. So maybe I might do that again. I'm not sure. So, but anyways, I'm really happy that high school sports is getting ready to come back. Um, but there's, you know, the vacation rentals with Airbnb in San Diego, they just made some big decisions. Um, Padres, Aztecs, Jack Murphy stadium getting blown up and uh, all the history there. Um, there's a new vaccine from Johnson and Johnson, a single dose. that's supposed to be really good. I mean, there's just a lot of really good current topics to discuss. And I'm like, which direction do I go? It, it's almost, there was more than I could even imagine. And there's been a bunch of other things recently in the news that I had considered like Larry Flint. I think he just died. I mean, Larry Flint, you know, the guy behind, you know, in the, in the porn industry, but more importantly, it, the, a huge advocate for free speech. I mean, I think Larry Flint in his own way is a hero. I mean, for really being an advocate for the first amendment, um, you know, Mark Cuban shut down the national anthem at the Dallas Mavericks game. So there's so much that we can talk about in this podcast. And that's kind of the joy and the fun of doing it. And hopefully you enjoy it too. And, and by the way, I'm always interested in your thoughts and comments. If there are topics you think I should cover, I mean, let me know. And I've, some of my podcast episodes have been from viewer and listener um, input. They've tipped me off on some ideas or some people have just said, boy, it'd be really great if you covered this. And then sure enough, I'll just do some research and I'll do my best to cover it. Um, but anyways, let's let's talk about Fry's electronics and capitalism. And, um, you know, the news just broke just was it today, I think, that Fry's electronics is going out of business. And you may think like, you know, who in the hell's Fry's electronics? Well, they're a consumer electronics store, right? They they sell computers and stereos and and gaming consoles, but they also sell, um, you know, dishwashers and refrigerators and washer and dryers. They sell, um, I don't know, big screen TVs. I mean, it's just a big consumer electronics store, and they're you know around the United States and and we've had we had two of them here in San Diego County. I mean, there's the one down in Murphy Canyon, right off of Arrow Drive exit off the 15. And there's another one up in San Marcos. And I remember when those stores just came out, a lot of people just love them. I mean, they just love going down there because, you know, they're a bunch of computer, computer nerds, computer electronics fans, and they just love the whole scene there. And I remember going down there for me, I remember in the beginning, I, it was a very uncomfortable going to a Fry's electronics store. I don't know if you felt the same way. I mean, besides the fact that the place was just enormous, I mean, it was just, it was way bigger than a Costco. And then you get in there and there, there was, cause there were so many people in the store. It was often really difficult to get someone to help you. And then the checkout process there was insane. I mean, you had to go through this maze, like a habit trail of all these impulse buy things, whether they were inexpensive DVDs or candy or whatever, you'd have to weave through this, like this maze. And then eventually you get to the front of the line and there are like 15 checkout uh, stands. And then there's someone there that will tell you which one to go to. And then the checkout person would, you know, have a sign and would say number 12. And then you'd have to walk to number 12. And for me, it was like, what is this? This is different than I've ever experienced. And so it was always uncomfortable. And then, and then I remember, there was a certain, I don't know what the right word. It was almost like being in a Vegas casino, you know, like when you're playing blackjack and the dealer isn't really friendly, you know, they're just doing their job. And I kind of had that, that coldness vibe when I was always in that arrow drive Murphy Canyon fries. And so I would go back a few times and just never, never dug it. And, uh, but again, some of my other friends just absolutely loved it. So I thought it was just maybe me and my idiosyncrasies. But then eventually I would start going again because sometimes I couldn't find what I was looking for. And then I started going on the one in San Marcos and that one was way better. I mean, it was kind of really cool decorations. They had this gigantic aquarium in there that was fun. And I had a much better experience at the one in San Marcos. So I don't know 
what your experience was at Fry's Electronics. But, um, you know, I, I began over time to like them more. And so now they went from a negative probably to a neutral or maybe slightly above neutral. And I still like Best Buy better. But for me, Best Buy was more convenient because, you know, I live in Poway and there's one in Carmel Mountain Ranch. But Best Buy, in, you know, as an individual store often doesn't have a lot of inventory and not as big of a selection as Fry's does. And plus, Fry's has all kinds of other things. Um, so it's just it's just interesting. But anyways, Fry's closed down. And there were a lot of people that were really upset about this. And on Twitter, I, there was a, you know, there was on my Twitter feed, I, I enjoy being on Twitter. If you want to follow me, my handle there is John Riley Poway. And then some guy was really angry. He was like, ah, Fry's closed down. And what do we have left now? I think there's only Best Buy. And, and then he referenced some other consumer electronics company, but it wasn't local. It must be, I don't know, on the East Coast or the Midwest. And he goes, that's all there is. And, you know, what are we going to do? And, oh, the, you know, and he started bagging on capitalism. Like, oh, this is capitalism. It's just screwing everything up. And I mean, I normally I don't respond with, you know, a sharp message back in Twitter to people that I don't know, but I couldn't help myself. So I, I typed in a message and I just want to share it with you. I, I wrote to this guy. And he was, again, upset about capitalism, essentially reducing his choices. And I said that, well, you know, capitalism has increased the options that you have where you can buy consumer electronics. I go, some of it has moved to, yeah, to big box stores, and some of it has moved to specialty retailers. Uh, and there's just a ton of places you can buy it online. I mean, the economy evolves, right? That's That's what I wrote. I mean, I'm kind of adding a little inflection in my voice to this. But then, then this, this morning when I was preparing for this podcast, figuring out what I was going to talk about, I went back just to see if there were any comments to my tweet. And the guy blocked me for that, which was insane. But that's, again, I should have known better. But as I started thinking about this, I said, well, this is actually a really good topic for a podcast because, you know, we're, we're, I'm doing this podcast. I'm using a lot of consumer electronics just to do the podcast. And you're probably listening or watching with consumer electronics and we've all had our own experiences in these stores. So I'm interested in your thoughts. If you've ever been to a Best Buy or a Fry's or any kind of a consumer electronics store, what's been your experience or do you buy online now? And what's your experience there? Kind of interested because it all plays into what's going on with Fry's. And now like speaking for myself, this podcast, I mean, everything in my podcast, I bought on Amazon. So I've got, you know, the microphone, the mic stand. And there's a bunch of things you can't see over here. I have an audio interface that connects my XLR mic into you into a an audio interface, which then allows a USB into my computer, which was where I'm recording the audio. And then I've got a Sony camera straight ahead, which you can see there, and a you know a stand. I've got lights and you know a bunch of stuff. And I bought it all online, which was great. I mean, I did my research online and bought it all through Amazon and it just showed up at my door and it was just fantastic. Um, but my TVs in our house, I know we bought all of those from Sam, from Best Buy and we've always had Samsungs and because it, it's just always worked for us. Um, and uh, my computers, I always buy those online. Um, I kind of focused on always having Lenovo as my brand of choice for my notebook computers. And that's because one of my buddies up in San Francisco is, a, is an IT professional in an accounting firm and he always buys Lenovo. He has great response results with them. So I figure I'm going to buy Lenovo and, and then, you know, other knickknacks I'll usually buy online. So I started thinking about it is now when I ever have to go into a Best Buy, it's usually just because I need like a USB cable and I need it right now and I'll go, but you know, a lot of times I can get some of that same stuff at like Walmart or, I mean, you go into a Costco, there's a lot of consumer electronics there too. So the economy evolves. And a lot of times, like this guy, you know, he's probably bumming out that fries is gone because he may have been one of those people that loved fries. But the economy is always evolving. And I think a lot of people just don't really grasp that. I mean, it's, it's constantly in motion, right? So companies are starting, companies are closing. You know, the, the industry is shifting. I mean, when I go into Costco, uh, I typically go to the one in Poway, up off of Scripps Poway Parkway. Right when you walk in, it's boom, it's all consumer electronics. There's like televisions and 
Wi-Fi mesh networks and, um, you know, you know, audio, uh, audio bars and, 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 um, uh, Bluetooth speakers. I mean, all kinds of consumer electronics. So you figure for fries and even for Best Buy, some of that business has moved to Costco because they can do it in some cases better, um, or less expensively. Then in other cases, some of those categories are moving to like Lowe's or Home Depot. I mean, we see a lot of refrigerators and, and washers and dryers. I mean, you can buy that at, at one of those big box hardware stores now, and you can get it from a lot of other spaces. And then there's a lot of specialty retailers. Like here in San Diego, there's a really good camera uh, retailer, and they got a, like two or three locations it's called George's Camera. And actually, I've gone there when I needed to buy like a little knickknack like for my podcast, and I needed it right away. And it was something related to, to cameras or to video. And they're really good. So the industry, you know, it moves and changes. Um, have you ever been into a Pacific Sales? That's a really interesting store. They, I know they got a bunch of them in San Diego. And there's one up in Escondido that we've been to a few times. They sell the really high end appliances, um, you know, rather than kind of the, the medium to lower end, which you'll probably mostly find in a Best Buy, the, you know, like the Viking grills and all those. And th those are fun to go check those out. And I think we bought something from them once. I can't remember what it was. It might've been our refrigerator. No, we, our last refrigerator, actually our last refrigerator, we bought at Best Buy. Um, so, Anyways, the, 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 the marketplace evolves, right? And so this guy who loves fries was really upset. And, you know, he's probably stuck in that paradigm, right? That's stuck in that mode of, oh, my God, the one retailer I love is gone and evil capitalism screwed me over. Well, he's not understanding that, you know, things are constantly changing. Uh, Pete Neal uh, on, the, on the live stream chimes in, I loved fries, Notice the, the tense grammatical, it's closing. Perhaps the adjective usage will kick in. Yeah, fries is closing. And for a lot of people, they're really bummed out because it was a store that they really loved. I mean, for a lot of people, they would just go hang out at fries. But, you know, so much of this stuff we can buy on Amazon and a lot of other, you know, I remember like there are a whole bunch of like really aggressive camera stores that are in New York and in the Northeast. And they all have really strong online presences and they are doing a lot of aggressive online marketing, competing with Amazon and a lot of other retailers, but they're more niche, right? They're more focused on cameras and video, um, you know, still cameras and video cameras. So there's just fierce competition online. And so sometimes when we think that, oh my God, a brick and mortar place just went out of business. Well, the amount of new entrepreneurs online selling stuff is just unlimited. And not only are so many companies selling through Amazon, you know, using Amazon as their retailer, but there are all these other retailers that have online presences. And so while we may have lost fries, we've got countless options that are online where we can buy more than fries ever even offered. Um, Justin Frazier on the live stream chimes in, online sales does not support our local economy like a brick and mortar store. Many stores are closing due to government COVID restrictions. And that, that is part of it. COVID is a double-edged sword. And I'm going to get to COVID in a moment here. Um, but yeah, the local economy, um, you know, retailers, local retailers definitely are helpful for the local economy, but you got to see the writing on the wall here. I mean, when, when the economy is evolving, certain businesses are going to, are going to fail to evolve with the economy and they may go under other uh, situations, new opportunities come up with the evolving economy that are great for our local business. Um, you know, and, and as, as well as a lot of online retailers, I mean, a lot of them have warehouses and shipping capabilities here. I mean, here in Poway, they just built an insane, huge, massive Amazon distribution facility, which has caused a big stir in Poway and a lot of people angry because it's, it's upsetting their view. And I mean, that's a whole other topic. In fact, I was encouraged to do a podcast topic just on the Amazon warehouse in Poway. And I've commented a lot of it, uh, often in a lot of my podcasts about it. But, but you, Justin, you're right. I mean, brick and mortar does support our local economy. But 
retail evolves, right? So our local economy has to evolve with it. Um, but if, if we insist on keeping brick and mortar, well, at some point, some of those brick and mortar stores, they're just not going to have the revenue. Com customers are going to find it more convenient to buy online in certain business categories. And then at some point, some of those brick and mortars are going to go out of business. Um, but COVID is key. And again, I'm going to come to COVID in just a minute. I kind of have this prepared presentation here. But um, Pat Johnson on the live stream says, I think Fry's died due to poor customer service and expanded inventory outside their base electronics they started with. Now, that's possible because I, I always had like not a positive consumer uh, or customer service feeling, customer service vibe when I was in a Fry's. It was always kind of cold to me. Uh, maybe you've experienced something different, but yeah, maybe as Fry's was scrambling, they may have gone outside their sweet spot and began selling products beyond that scope. And if they did, that may have eroded their brand. You know, they weren't maybe known as, as the place to go. If, if they're suddenly starting to sell furniture and a lot of things outside the scope of consumer electronics. And in fact, I think they were selling furniture, but I think more in the, more in the scope of um, home theater, but still, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of explanations for why Fry's went out of business, but what's interesting is, is that even while Fry's, has gone out of business. Best Buy had their best quarter in 25 years. Oh my God. So you're thinking, how could Fry's go down the drain while Best Buy is just killing it? And I want to I want to share some of this. This is where we're going to get into some of the COVID stuff. So this is from an article um, actually in November of 2020. And Best Buy, actually they're talking about no, they do their quarters weird. Their quarter ended on October 31st. So they didn't even really correspond to calendar quarters. But Best Buy said uh, that their sales at stores open for at least one year grew 23% during the three months ending on October 31st. So this is right in the heat of COVID where people are bunkering down in quarantine. They saw their, their sales go up 23%. Um, compared with the same time the previous year. And this marked Best Buy's largest quarterly sales increase in 25 years. Uh, much of Best Buy's growth came from home delivery and curbside sales, um, curbside pickup sales. So there's COVID for you. So Best Buy was able to adapt to COVID. Best Buy was able to deliver directly to the home and they were allowed, allowing people to essentially buy online and pick up at curbside. Um, online sales boomed 174% last quarter and accounted for more than one third of the company's sales. Best Buy's net sales increased to 11.9 billion in the quarter, while its profit grew to 391 million. And if you, I did the quick math on that. It's interesting. Uh, Best Buy's profit is only 3.2% of revenue. This is kind of a little bit of a tangent, but a lot of times people are like really angry at these these large corporations and, oh my God, they're, you know, the profit and it's raping, you know, the industry and, and it's killing, they're, they're too greedy and they're, they're taking too much profit. Well, their profit margin is only 3.2% um, over a quarter that was one of their best quarters ever, um, which is to me is an interesting side note, but that goes to show you how fiercely competitive the consumer electronics space is and how really capitalism and, entrepreneurship and all these online competitors makes Best Buy as, you know, keeps them honest and keeps their prices as low as they can go. But in this article, Best Buy said they've benefited from consumers shifting their spending away from travel, leisure, and other services into areas such as electronics, home improvement, and sporting goods. And in fact, Dick's Sporting Goods um, reported that for their stores open at least one year, their, their sales grew 23.2% at Dick's. This is a couple of interesting angles to this because the, the home improvement industry has been just exploding. And, you know, companies like Depot and Lowe's and other, you know, companies that sell products for people in their home have just been seeing huge results because of COVID. And some companies have been responding better than others. Now here, Best Buy has 
you know, they, they had the, the online infrastructure to be able to order online the curbside pickup. Now, I don't know, was Fry's able to do that? Were they effective with their online sales? Were they effective with buy online and pick up curbside? I don't know. I mean, those are some questions to ask, but Tom, about sporting goods. My daughter is a, a cyclist. You know, she's done triathlons. She did an Ironman triathlon a couple of years ago. We were so proud of her. Um, but the, in the bike, uh, the bicycling community, their sales are going through the roof because in COVID people are wanting to get out and exercise because they can't do a lot of other things. And if you want to order a bike, I mean, a lot of them are back order. We have to wait months to get them. Um, so for a lot of these retailers, they don't have very much inventory to sell because bikes sell so quickly. Um, so the, the cycling industry has been radically affected by COVID as well, which is an interesting angle to it. So one of the um, managing directors for Best Buy went on to say, when it comes to higher priced electronics, consumers are more confident purchasing from a retailer with stores, especially if they want to see and experience products before they buy. Um, and yeah, that, that, that I'm sure Best Buy is emphasizing that because that is their strategic advantage that Amazon and other online retailers can't do. Now, for myself, the, the reviews online have been so great. I mean, you can watch videos of these products. You can see experts that review these products. In a lot of cases, you almost don't have to go in and touch it before you buy it. But I know a lot of buyers are conditioned that way. They want to experience it. They don't want to get screwed over and get something to deliver to them that isn't of their, of their of the quality they demand. But Best Buy, to their credit, is emphasizing their unique differentiator um, now, granted, Fry's had that same differentiator, but they failed to capitalize on it. Um, but really, you know, we know a lot of this retailing, especially for consumer electronics, is moving online. Best Buy has been able to adapt. And then as a side note, Best Buy stock is up 40% year to date. Now, this was in November. So I don't know, where is it now? How's Best Buy stock doing? Is it, I'm sure it's not like um, uh, AMC or or GameStop, but to me, this is just really interesting how while Fry's has gone out of business, Best Buy is killing it. A couple more comments on the live stream. Um, Pete Neal says, agreeing with Pat, you know, and Pat said that Best Buy probably died because of poor customer service and expanded inventory outside their base. Pete says, agreeing with Pat, but I also somewhat think the progress of quote unquote finished technology also had a big part tech is le less geek and more mainstream. And that's true. Um, Yuri Bolin goes on to say, restrictions will lead to monopolies. Okay. We're going to get into monopolies in a moment, Yuri, because this is a big, a big angle to this whole story. So, so anyways, um, yeah, so Best Buy had a great quarter. I mean, they were killing it. Um, and let's go now, if you go to the Fry's website, now, which is, I don't know, what is it? Fry'selectronics.com, I think. And they just have a, a, a like a, a single letter to their customers. I mean, you can't do anything on their website. And it says, after nearly 36 years in business as once of it, as the one-stop shop and online resource for high-tech professionals across nine states and 31 stores, Fry's Electronics has made the difficult decision to shut down its operations and close its business permanently as a result of changes in the retail industry and the challenges posed by COVID-19 pandemic. So now I'm wondering, well, wait a minute. So COVID-19 created this huge opportunity for Best Buy. I mean, because people were, weren't traveling, they weren't going on vacation, they were spending money on home improvement. You know, they were probably upgrading their television sets and their computer equipment. And, and then Best Buy was able to capitalize on COVID by making their online experience better, by having curbside pickup, but Fry's is using COVID-19 as the reason that they failed. So what was, what's the problem? Was it the fact that maybe people didn't want to go in the store and they didn't quickly adapt enough to quickly enough to curbside, or was it maybe that they didn't have a problem keeping employees? I mean, who knows what the problem is? Most likely people probably didn't want to go in the store and curbside pickup. I mean, that's a big, big deal. And you know, one of one of my clients that I work with, they're working to transition their business 
from traditional retailing to curbside pickup. And, and originally their plan was to do what they call BOPIS, buy online, pick up in store, B-O-P-I-S. But now the focus is trying to get into, you know, essentially curbside pickup, buy online, pick up curbside. I mean, you just drive up into a parking spot and someone will bring it to you. And in the COVID crisis, I mean, businesses need to think that way. They have to adapt as the economy evolves. Now, I don't know what Fry's did or how they handled their crisis, but clearly they they failed. I mean, they're, they're going out of business. Um, more comments on the live stream here. Pat Johnson said, Best Buy also does price match, which for people like me that likes to keep my money and also likes to touch and see before I buy. So yeah, I mean, if you're in the consumer electronics space, you have to be very aggressive price-wise because people will shop you to death and they'll, they'll find things online at lower prices. A online re- an online, excuse me, a brick and mortar company has to be able to meet those prices or their business is just going to go away. Pat Johnson said, and the best customer service for the most part is great. Um, excuse me, Best Buy customer service for the most part is great. I too have had great experience with Best Buy customer service. And um, I remember, gosh, when we moved into this house in 2007, we went and bought our first flat screen TV. And I call it flat screen because back then it was still probably six inches at its fullest width, but maybe three inches at its narrowest. And I remember we wanted to mount it on a wall and there, it was something that was not an easy thing for a regular homeowner to mount on a wall. And this TV was, it was flat screen, but it was really heavy. So I knew that you, you, they sold these mounts, but you got to mount the mount to the, to the studs on the wall. And I figured, okay, this is outside my capabilities above my pay grade. I'm going to hire out for this. And the guys that were doing that, it was a specialty thing. And typically only, you know, generally speaking, more wealthy people could afford the big screen TV, the flat screen. So they charged a lot for mounting and it was insane. I I can't remember how much we spent. It might've been like a thousand dollars because that was what the marketplace was. Um, And we bit the bullet. Well, now when our last, eventually that TV failed after about 10 or 11 years, which is great. I mean, that's a long, that's a nice long run for a television set. But then when we needed a new Samsung, we went to Best Buy, but this time I hired the Geek Squad to come out and install it because our old, ra- our, our old mounting bracket would not work with the new TV, you know, of course. It's like, remember back in the day when you buy a new phone, you had to get a new charging cord. Well, the Best Buy customer service, their, their Geek Squad came out. They, it only cost us, I think, like an extra $79. They did all the work. They cleaned up when they were done. And it was easy and they were friendly and they were nice. So yeah, Best Buy customer service, my experience has been really good. Whenever I've had to return something there, it's never been a problem. Um, they, they typically have easier access to floor staff than I experienced when I was at Fry's. Now, a lot of that had to do with the fact that Fry's had sometimes an insane number of people in their warehouse store. So, you know, they couldn't possibly staff up to handle that. Um, Best Buy has been able to manage that a lot better. And Pete, <laughs> Pete is uh, in a love fest with Pat. Pete is in lockstep with Pat on his experience with both Fry's and with Best Buy. Um, but it was just another interesting nugget. I, I learned this about Fry's. Um, they're based in San Jose, which I didn't know that. The privately held company it was a family business, and it was founded in 1985. So that's actually quite a long time ago um, in, in this world of consumer electronics. And it was founded by the three Fry brothers, F-R-Y, with the goal of being a Silicon Valley retail electronics store to provide a one-stop shopping environment for the high-tech professional. So yeah, a a worthy goal. And this is another interesting nugget from the article. Many of the retail locations had wacky themes. For example, its Burbank location was inspired by 1950s sci-fi movies and had UFO decoration crashing through the exterior of the store. And its Phoenix, Arizona location had an ancient Aztec temple. And its Houston, Texas store was inspired by the state's oil history. So I remember the Fry's store up in San Marcos, they had a theme and it might've been UFO. I can't remember exactly, but I remember there was a theme there. And the one 
on off Arrow Drive in Murphy Canyon of San Diego. I don't know if they had a theme. That was one of the earlier stores for San Diego. Um, and in this article from CNN, it said the retailer, they're talking about fries, the retailer didn't innovate its online operations as rapidly compared to its largest rivals. And then they cite Best Buy having um, their best quarter in 25 years. So just a, a really interesting story with fries going out of business because so many of us, we buy stuff. I mean, we buy stuff from fries. We buy stuff from Best Buy. We, we buy from Amazon and user, you know, customer behavior is changing where we buy things. COVID, yes, COVID, um, you know, as Justin was saying, COVID has made a huge difference in our customer behavior and where we buy and how we shop and which stores we want to go into and how comfortable we are being around other people during the pandemic. And it appears that Best Buy was able to adapt to COVID, but for whatever reason, I don't know why, Fry's failed. So again, I look forward to some of your comments on this. Um, Pete Neal says, I will say I miss Circuit City. Yeah, I remember those guys. Um, there was a Circuit City, I remember, when Carmel Mountain was first built, if I recall. Um, and yeah, that was the place you go buy a, a TVs and refrigerators and stereos and, and, and they failed. Um, and I think they might've failed. Did they fail during the great recession or did they fail earlier? Like when the dot-com bubble bo burst in 2000, 2001, it was one, one of those timeframes that circuit city couldn't keep up with all of it. But I just want to make this point because I think this is a larger point. We're going to kind of get into this topic of capitalism because you know, despite Fry's shutting down, I mean, which is an unfortunate event, there, there's still, this, this is a society, a, an economy of abundance. I mean, there are just countless options, countless products and services to buy. And even though there are some companies that fail to evolve, there are other companies that are constantly starting up and competing and getting into the marketplace. There are new online competitors. Um, there are new, there are some of the existing brick and mortar are starting to move into that consumer electronic space like a Lowe's, a Home Depot, a Costco. So it's, there's still, there's just so much abundance, so much opportunity. I mean, just, just look around and it makes you wonder like with all this opportunity, how did Fry's fail? I mean, it always comes down to management and leadership and, and how they execute. Right. But what's interesting to me is that if you really apply capitalism properly Capitalism encourages more abundance, more opportunity, more options, because it incentivizes that profit motive, incentivizes competitors to jump into the space and compete. And then on top of it right now with government, I mean, what they're doing right now with not just this $1.9 trillion deal that Biden's putting forward as a stimulus for COVID, there have been previous COVID stimuluses. And meanwhile, the Federal Reserve is just cranking up the production of money. There is so much money flowing through this economy. So much, if you are savvy, so much opportunity to take advantage of the abundance and the, the amazing flow of cash that's out there. Now, I realize for some people, they're struggling because of COVID. But for other people, COVID has been like mana from heaven. has created amazing opportunities for their business so that their businesses have trouble keeping up with demand, like people in the cycling industry, like, like Best Buy, like, like, a, like a lot of other businesses, they've seen their business explode. Home Depot and Lowe's have seen their numbers greatly increase. Uh, so again, on the, on the live stream here, Pat Johnson says, don't forget to mention the best company to adapt to the globalization of the economy, Amazon. They meet your needs for almost everything. Great customer service, fast delivery, and great prices. And I agree. I, I've had fantastic success with Amazon. And I've had cases where they failed on delivery. Like I remember I ordered, I needed an additional light for my podcast. And the light came, but the stand that I ordered as part of the package didn't arrive. So I contacted Amazon and they said, just keep it. Because they knew it was too much of a hassle to ship it back or to ship a new stand. They just said, just keep it. In other cases, I've tried product, wasn't happy with it. I packaged it, boxed it up, brought it down to my buddy, um, uh, Dennis at the Post Atlantics here in Poway, right next to Target. He takes it, he packages it up and Amazon pays the freight and boom, it's done. It's, you get credit on your account. Amazon makes it really easy. I've had great, great 
success with Amazon. Um, now, you know, results vary. I'm sure some people have had great, some people maybe have had less than great experiences. I'm interested in your thoughts and comments. Justin Frazier says, I miss Radio Shack. <laughs> now, I remember one of my biggest pet peeves with Radio Shack, and this is this is before really personal computers were a big thing. This is like in the 1980s. And even in the early 90s, whenever you'd had to go to a Radio Shack, they would always ask you for your name and address, and they would write it out on the sales slip. I'm thinking, okay, I get it. You want my address because this is back before email. You want my address, so I'm on your mailing list. I totally understand that. But they would ask it every single time you buy, bought something there. And I'm thinking, okay, these guys are failing if they're not able to verify if the address is already in the system. But Best Buy, once again, they failed to really adapt. I mean, there was a time when they were on the forefront. Remember, they had the, the TRS-80 computer, right? The Trash-80. We talked about that in a previous podcast. And they, um, they were, you know, on the front line of the, of the personal computer revolution, and especially when there were kits available and people can build them. But at some point, they just, they lost traction. They didn't keep up with the times. And then they eventually evolved into that retail store where you can always buy some weird ass electronic adapter. They always had it, right? But that's all they really were, at least for me. I mean, I wouldn't buy a stereo there or any consumer electronics because they never really had the good stuff. Um, but yeah, Radio Shack had that friendly neighborhood feel. Um, Matthew Brannigan says, there really aren't any places now for hobbyists to get a few bits and bobs for electronics projects. Yeah, that's a fair point. And Radio Shack, filled that role. Fry's filled that role. Um, to a sp le lesser degree, I, I can go into Walmart and I can, if I need like a USB cable or, you know, something like that, Walmart sometimes has it. Best Buy more frequently will have it. But yeah, uh, for that kind of thing, you almost have to order online and it takes you a couple of days to get it. And that stinks. It'd be nice if there were brick and mortar places that had that, but clearly that business is, it's shifted. And you know, the, the, you know, there's a book called Who Moved My Cheese? The cheese was moved. Um, and that's just the reality. And that we kind of long for those old days when we can just go to our local electronics store around the block, right next to our local hardware store and our local pet food supply store. I remember I had that when I grew up. Um, who else? More, more comments on the live stream. Yuri Boland says, even though they had been gone a long time, uh, Circuit City was better than Best Buy. Yeah, so again, people had varying opinions. Um, Pat Johnson said, you should do a podcast on the stimulus package and all of the non COVID things in there. That's a good idea. Um, cause I was just reading an article about it and you know, it's like the, uh, Rahm Emanuel quote, never let a crisis go to waste. So there's just a ton of pork that's in that COVID stimulus bill. That's a great, that's a great idea for a podcast, Pat. And then Pete Neal says, I may be the only person that does not have an Amazon account. A long time ago, I refused to sign up. I don't do Amazon and I don't do monolith organizations. <clears throat> you know, you're uh, Pete, you need to evolve <laughs> with the times. I'm telling you, Amazon is a great thing. You just you click, click, boom, it arrives at your doorstep. So, you know, there's so much opportunity that's out there, but still some people, okay, Pete, this isn't necessarily directed to you, but some people have trouble seeing what the current reality is. You know, some people just refuse to acknowledge that the world has changed. You know, they, they, some people are still kind of stuck with an old fashioned view. I mean, think of Tower Records or think of Borders Bookstore, right? My guess is, is they were still kind of caught up with the romance of the neighborhood bookstore, that neighborhood record store, and they didn't really evolve fast enough. Their leadership didn't adapt to the new reality. But then, even at the corporate level, you know, there's still a lot of management that are stuck in an old fashioned paradigm. There's, and a lot of them have had to break through that. I mean, with this COVID crisis, people working from home, a lot of managers at first, they didn't like that. They, they didn't feel they could trust their employees because they figured if they work from home, they'd be screwing around and, you know, just sitting on the couch watching TV all day. Well, they quickly learned that their employees in many cases were more productive and happier and had greater control of their work-life balance and that they didn't really need to have the, their employees in the office. And now they don't need as much office space. And that, that's creating a whole cascading effect in the commercial real estate industry. But yeah, some, some 
managers are old school and just wouldn't, they wouldn't really go there. They wouldn't let their employees work from home. Um, but there's, you know, there's still like, there's restaurants that, you know, are old school mom and pop, you know, all paper-based restaurants. They got the wait, waiter comes out, you know, hand writes the order and some businesses have evolved and, and some haven't. So some are still stuck in, in some of those old paradigms. And I think it's because things change so fast in this economy that a lot of times it's just easier on your brain to just revert back to what you know, you know, rather than having to, you know, churn brain cycles to learn new things and adapt. Some people just fall back into what works, what they're comfortable with. And, you know, the older you are, the more likely you're going to be in that situation. And, you know, I, it's funny because I'll have conversations with my, with my, my mom that, you know, she hasn't been evolving fast enough, but then I have conversations with my children and I learned that I'm not evolving fast enough. So, you know, it's a generational thing. It's funny, but there, there are also companies that fail to see the future, right? Some, some fail to see reality as it is today and revert to an old paradigm. But there are some that maybe they understand the reality today, but they don't look more than, you know, in front of their nose. They don't see what's coming. And, you know, a great example of that is Blockbuster, right? Blockbuster didn't really see the evolution that was necessary to go to online streaming. And in fact, at least if I understand the story correctly, Blockbuster had an opportunity to, to buy Netflix or to be one of the big investors in Netflix and Blockbuster turned it down. They didn't see the benefit in it and they eventually got steamrolled. Um, so, you know, and there's countless examples of businesses that are like that, that fail to see the future. They fail to see where the economy is going. Um, again, more comments here on the live stream. Pat Johnson says, speaking of evolving, oh, Blockbuster, there it is. Blockbuster missed the boat of the changing environment and sank. Yeah, Blockbuster is probably one of the classic um, examples of this phenomenon. But you can see this whole angle of like people that have trouble seeing what the future is going to be. And I run into this myself and, and I have to keep opening up my mind. But one area where I'm reasonably confident I'm right is this whole notion of mass transit. And, you know, there's this big project that Sandag is talking about doing here in San Diego, and it's revolutionary, right? They're going to change the freeways. They're going to build light rail and all these things they want to do. And I mean, it's, 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 it's like a science fiction movie in some ways, but you know, look at, I, I, I just think, you know, we're talking about the romance of local bookstores and local record stores. I still think there are some people that have this romantic feeling with rail, you know, with the train and, and the beautiful train and people taking the train to where they want to go. But the train never can take you from point A to point B. You always got to take m multiple methods of transportation to get to the train. And then wherever the train lets you off, you got to take multiple modes of transportation to get where you're going to go your ultimate destination. But I see like, you know, over at UCSD, they just expanded a trolley out there. And I mean, it's like, I don't know what the exact number is, but it's gotta be hundreds of millions, if not a billion dollars to build that extension, you know, because they've got these huge infrastructure that they're building for the, the light rail, the travel way above the freeway. And I mean, it's a huge deal. But then I think, you know, this economy, transportation with, and again, I'm a big EV guy, but autonomous, driverless cars, driverless electronic vehicles, to me, is going to be where the future goes. Because people could have a car come to their location and take them precisely to where they want to go. And these cars can use the existing infrastructure. They could go on the existing roads. And unlike our current cars today, these electronic vehicles can communicate with one another. And that means that they can travel in packs like a swarm of bees. And they can drive bumper to bumper safely because the cars can communicate with one another. And that means that the freeways won't be nearly as clogged and there won't be that slinky effect that we feel driving through traffic because they're going to be able to move together as one blob. And then cars will just peel off and take exits as necessary. I, again, I'm not a professional in this space, but my hunch is, is that the future of transportation is going to be more evolving with technology 
like auto autonomous electronic cars, electric vehicles, more so than going backwards to 19th century technology like railroads. Uh, but still, there's this thing where people are stuck in these old paradigms. Um, and what else? I mean, there's um, another example is like education, right? Now, I know with this COVID crisis, a lot of our families have been challenged by online education. And for some people, it works great. For other people, it doesn't. But still, education has evolved so much, not, with just, not just with online learning, but there's all these really narrow niches of specialized education that are available today. But still, you look at a classroom today in 2021, it looks like a classroom from 1821, where you know you got 20 or 30 desks all lined up and there's a teacher in the front of the room and there's, well, maybe it's not a chalkboard anymore, it's a whiteboard. But sometimes you wonder, has education evolved? Or is it still kind of stuck in the old paradigm, particularly public K through 12 education? Makes me wonder, makes me think, you know? So are we seeing how it's evolving? You know, it's, it's almost like that, you know, like you're a quarterback and you can see where the wide receivers are going and you throw the ball to where they're going. You can see it, the, the, the future sort of um, unopen in front of you. And it's like the, that classic Gretzky quote, what is it? Um, skate, I skate to where the puck is going, not where it's been, you know? So it's that angle that I think is, is really important. But I think a lot of companies fail to do that. And that's why a lot of them go out of business because their leadership doesn't have that, that, visionary, um, that visionary ability to really see where the marketplace is going. Uh, Pete Neal says, we are not far from autonomous vehicles. Uber will evolve to delivering you a car without a driver then that car will take you where you want to go. So car ownership will cease to exist. Pat will still have his 442 and I'll have Calypso. Yeah. yeah. See, this is cool. Now, this is a great topic. I agree. I think we'll be able to summon a car. And, you know, on one level, it's like summoning a taxi. But it's like, remember in the movie um, uh, Total Recall with Arnold Schwarzenegger and he's on Mars and they had the Johnny Cab, which was like an autonomous cab. But they had like, like a fake robot guy that was annoying as hell, but funny, and uh, that would drive for you. So yeah, the whole notion of, of summoning a driverless car, they'll show up at your house and take you where you want to go. And you don't have to take a, a taxi drive to get to the train station and then a train to get to another train station. And then you got to walk or take a bus to where you want to go. I mean, you just go from point A to point B perfectly. Um, I think a lot of it's going to evolve that way. And then imagine if we have autonomous cars that we can just summon, then most people won't need a garage. So now suddenly real estate, that market changes, um, not just residential real estate where garages will be less necessary. Although if you have, you know, the 442 like Pat or, or you have the Corvette Calypso like Pete, you're going to want a garage. But for a lot of people, they won't need a garage. But then imagine for commercial real estate, they won't need these massive parking structures and parking lots. And even when they're building more high density um, apartment buildings, like right now in San Diego, there's a lot of regulations that require a certain number of parking spots be made available as a ratio of the number of units in that structure. Well, if we can summon cars and less people have cars, well, that's gonna shift as well. And that's gonna change the way construction is done. It's gonna change the way, the, really the density of housing, especially in, in highly urban areas. So the, the, the future is going to change a lot, but we've all got to evolve and we got to follow the future. And I think that's critical. So um, what else on the live stream? Matthew Brannigan says, before San Diego City spent um, huge amounts on rail, they should at least fix all the huge potholes that are everywhere. Poway is ahead of the ball on road maintenance. Well, no doubt. Poway is ahead of the ball. I know like where I live, um, I live off of Stone Canyon Road in Poway. And then when I come off of Stone Canyon and I get on a Pomerado, at that moment, it becomes San Diego. And then instantly, the road quality takes a giant downward, uh, uh, it, it falls off a cliff, essentially. And But I will give Faulkner credit. I mean, Kevin Faulkner, as mayor of San Diego, did a lot of work to fix the roads because he knows that's a common complaint. But I think as Todd Gloria, the new mayor of San Diego, is realizing is that 
that was just surface level fix surface level fixes that underneath the infrastructure you know the the um the wastewater systems and everything else that's underneath the roads that is partly the reason why there are so many potholes. I mean, the infrastructure needs huge work in San Diego. So Faulkner was able to put it in a nice package and, and I, I can't remember the amount of miles of roads that he had repaired, but it was a lot. Um, but Poway does a great job. I mean, there's a lot, of, a lot of things I think that Poway does very, very well as a city that's, you know, we all have our complaints about the city, but generally speaking, it's, it's well run. And road maintenance is one of the categories where they do a really good job. And I think I may have my numbers wrong on this, but correct me if I am off base. But I think what they do is they divide the city into, is it eight zones? And then once every eight years, one of those zones gets all their streets repaved, um, you know, new asphalt, everything. So every eight years, your, your road will get repaired. And as a result, they don't really ever have, have like these massive potholes that San Diego used to see all over the place. So interesting stuff. Um, Pat Johnson said it's seven. Thank you, Pat. There are seven zones in the city of Poway. So um, what I want to now just touch on, oh my God, we're at an hour and five minutes. Um, but I want to just touch on the, the, remember I talked about that guy on Twitter that was pissed at me and, and blocked me <laughs> only because I said that the economy is evolving and there's more options that are available to us now to buy consumer electronics. Even though fries went away, we can buy from a lot of on, uh, online retailers and even existing brick and mortar. There's a lot of more choices. We're not just stuck with Best Buy now that fries went away. And then, of course, he blocked me for it. But he was obviously bagging on capitalism. And I've talked about capitalism a bit in this podcast. I just want to share some thoughts on this. And, I, and it's really the virtues of capitalism that I want to share because I think this is really important because right now, you know, people that's the big battle, socialism or capitalism. And, and people describe one as good and one as evil. And it's this constant battle. Now I'm a fan of capitalism and I'm going to, I'm going to make the case. And I, and I think it's because there's a profit motive. Profit motive is a good thing. The profit motive is what encourages a lot of these entrepreneurs to come to market, not necessarily just to only compete with the establishment companies, but also to innovate and, and to create better mousetraps. Now, they're going to, yeah, they're going to come up with new, you know, entrepreneurs are always coming up with new products, new services, new ways to make your life better because they're trying to one up the establishment companies. And for a lot of people buying online is, is better. I mean, how many times, I mean, for me, I've gone into stores, I'm looking for something and you go in like even to a Best Buy on the store, on the shelf, they don't have the current model. They got last year's model or you're looking for what you want and they don't have it, you know? So a lot of these online retailers have been able to essentially build a better mousetrap and they, for certain categories of certain categories of the industry, in my opinion, they're doing it better than a brick and mortar. So, and then the other crazy thing for our family, I don't know if you do this, but we, we um, subscribe to a company called HelloFresh. I don't know if you ever use them. There's other companies that are like HelloFresh. I think one of them might be called Blue Apron, I think is another one. But what they do is they deliver food to your house. And th the greatest thing is, is that you can pick recipes online and then they send them to you. And it comes in a refrigerated you know, package um, with, with ice packs and everything to keep everything fresh with fresh vegetables and all the ingredients you need. So you don't have to have like a spice rack that you know, is crazy. And you don't, maybe, you, you know, in a spice rack, usually you have every spice of known to man, except the one you actually need for that recipe. Well, they supply all the spices, all of the little vinegar bottles, everything you need and the, and the instructions to cook it. And it's awesome. And so we do that three times a week here in our house. We do hello fresh and it's just delivered right to us. I don't have to go to the store. I don't have to decide on recipes. They present options and we go, oh, that looks good. And they show the pictures of them online and go, okay, well, I want that one, that one, and that one. And then it shows up at your house. And then, you know, the we make dinner and I'm eating better. I'm eating more healthy. Um, it's kind of fun. I got new options um, and, and it's terrific. And it's because they've been able to innovate. Entrepreneurs have been able to innovate and essentially outsmart grocery stores in a lot of ways because they're providing this solution. And for us, it's been fantastic. I mean, I can't recommend 
HelloFresh enough. I think it's wonderful. Now, I want to talk to Yuri's comment, and I'm going to scroll back because Yuri talked about Monopoly. And I said I was going to talk about this. So where, where is it? Where did he say? Yeah, so Yuri said restrictions will lead to monopolies. Well, that, that is a common complaint amongst people that have, that, that have a capitalism. You see, if you have unfettered capitalism, it's just going to turn into monopolies because the big companies are going to crush the little companies or they're going to buy them and gobble them up. And we're going to, it just, capitalism, free markets just naturally evolve into one option, into one monopoly. And that, that myth continues to persist to this day. And it is the exact opposite of what actually happens in the real world. In the real world, the more the economy is free, the more entrepreneurs are popping up to innovate, to compete. Okay, so the the and we've seen companies like Netflix that have outsmarted Blockbuster. We've seen companies like Apple that have been able to outsmart Sony and the Walkman, or out, been Apple's been able to create iTunes, which essentially put um, Tower Records out of business. And then Amazon has innovated and been able to put Borders out of business. And I don't know, Barnes and Noble might be close. But there's always entrepreneurs that are coming up to compete against the established giants. I mean, even Sears used to be the king of retail and Sears is, they're gone, right? I think Sears is kaput. So this whole notion that capitalism will naturally evolve into monopolies is false. In fact, the only time you really get a true monopoly is when government makes competition illegal. When government provides a state-sanctioned monopoly that's when you get monopolies. Um, so again, I just reject that premise. Um, again, Yuri, I know you didn't exactly say that, but I, you did mention monopoly. I wanted to comment on that. And, and Yuri chimes in again. He says, competition equals better service and prices. And that is 100% true. Um, and I think that's why Best Buy was challenged by better competition, primarily online competition. And as Pat said, they do the price match. And so you know, that's, that's a good thing. And companies that fail to adapt to the competitive environment that maybe they are stuck in an old paradigm or they refuse to see the future, they'll get run over. But that's because they fail to evolve. Because the reason that they get run over is because there's always someone else out there that's thinking better, that's coming up with better ideas. Um, another example, a really good example of a of a state-sponsored monopoly was AT&T before they broke up. When was that, like 1979, 1980? Remember they created the baby bells and and now, you know, of course, telecommunications is was massively distributed and broken up and now it's starting to consolidate again. But it's gonna go through this evolution where it's gonna expand, consolidate, and the market shifts, the market evolves. But the AT&T actually had a government-sanctioned monopoly. Back then, other companies were, it was illegal to compete with them um, until the government broke them up and essentially deregulated the marketplace. And in my opinion, it's made it better. Um, communication is better. It's cheaper. It's more accessible. It's just better all the way around. Um, and even like, the you know, we talk about Texas and we were talk, commenting on that on Friday's podcast about the Texas energy crisis and um, how, you know, the, the lack of regulations is what caused the problem. And we could talk about the problems. And I think there are definitely problems in Texas. I think problems by management, leadership of those companies. But there are regulations that are in place today. I, I don't know if these apply necessarily in Texas, but this whole plug and play solar thing where people can essentially build their own solar arrays inexpensively and they don't have to be mounted on a roof. You can just put them on your patio or on your backyard lawn. And these are things that you know, you don't have to be a person of, of high means I and mean, you could be a renter. They're portable units. This is the kind of technology that that innovators come up with to do it better, cheaper, faster. And as a result, they make, they challenge a lot of these establishment companies, but often regulations prevent it. Um, and so that's why I'm a big fan of less regulation, which is going to allow more innovators, more competition. And Yuri goes on to say, uh, no, I like capitalism. And, and forgive me, Yuri, if I said that wrong originally. And I know you like capitalism. And I think, uh, like we said, capitalism equals competition and better prices and services. 
Pete said, where is Amazon's competition? Now, this is an interesting point. A lot of people are thinking, oh my God, Amazon is huge. They're taking everything over. Before we know it, there's not going to be any stores. It's all going to be on Amazon. Well, last I checked, um, Amazon as a total percent of retail market share was single digit. It was like 5%, you know, it might be six or 7% now. But if you look at all total retail, Amazon, just a minuscule fraction. Now, if you look at online retail, just online only, they have about half of the market, which is a lot, which is a ton. Um, but even Amazon has competitors. I mean, you can buy at bestbuy.com. You can shop for consumer electronics there and not at Amazon. So Amazon has competition, but they're, they've been very successful with their business model. And frankly, that's why Jeff Bezos is so damn rich because he's built a great business that's provided great benefits to their customers. Um, Yuri Boland says, just name the... Just the name is Russian, LOL. No, it's all good, Yuri. I like you, Yuri. In fact, Yuri, when you you came on and you were a podcast guest back in 2018 in your mayoral candidate, uh, your mayoral campaign, and I, I enjoyed that greatly. And I still feel bad to this day that our, we had an audio problem in that podcast. I'd love to have you back, Yuri. Um, you know, if we want to do a podcast sometime together, I'd love to have you as a guest. We can do it online or maybe when COVID eventually blows over, you can come back into the home studio. I'd love that. That'd be a lot of fun. So the invitation's on the, on, the, on the table. And in fact, I'm always looking for guests because sometimes, you know, I got to do this three times a week. It's a lot. And having guests certainly makes my life easier. But, you know, I talk about this podcast is all about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which is kind of my, what's the right word? My higher purpose, you know, this sort of grander idea of what I like to talk about, this framework. And you think about it, like, what economic system exists that is consistent with your life, your liberty, and your own pursuit of happiness? And the answer is capitalism. And that's the beauty of, of what I think capitalism is all about, is it is consistent with our individual rights, because it gives us the liberty, the freedom to innovate, to compete, to come up with new ideas, to change um, to experiment, to do a lot of things in this kind of an economy that other forms of economies, other non-capitalist forms of economy, there are restrictions in the amount of freedom and the things that you can do. Um, so you know, Yuri goes on to say, I'll be back next year. You running for mayor again in 2022? I hope you are. I thought you had a great campaign. So I would love to have you back on and we could talk about local Poway stuff or well, we could talk baseball too. I know you're a big baseball guy. Um, but I think the, the other part of what makes capitalism so great, in my opinion, and it's all based on voluntary cooperation. It's, it's based on people helping people because in capitalism, you can't get rich unless you help your customers get rich. You can't benefit yourself unless you help others benefit, you, know, you, you benefit other people. So it's, it's win-win. Capitalism is all about win-win. And it's, but it only ultimately comes down to, and this is the interesting part of it, why people, I think, struggle with capitalism, is they'll say, well, cap, you know, capitalism is all about people pursuing their self-interest, you know, and, you know, capitalism is consistent with selfishness, and it is, because what are Jeff Bezos, when he started his company, why was he doing it? Well, he had a grand vision. He wanted to be an innovator, but, you know, he was looking to create wealth. I mean, look at Steve Jobs when he created the iPhone. I mean, he had a vision. He wanted to create this groundbreaking product. He had his own selfish reasons for doing that. And he wanted to make more money, not just for him, but for the shareholders and the employees of Apple. So capitalism is ultimately about self-interest. And, and when done properly, it's win-win, where the two, two people voluntarily cooperate and they do it because... In both cases, they are improving their outcome. That's why they voluntarily cooperate. But there's a moral conflict because people think selfishness is bad. Selfish self-interest is not moral. And so that's why we have a lot of this struggle, I think, between capitalism and socialism or other forms of economic systems is because the moral code that people have growing up is that you should not be selfish, that you should always essentially sacrifice yourself for the other guy. Well, you should look out for someone else. You should be your brother's keeper. You should 
um, sacrifice your own individual needs for the benefit of other people. Um, that's why I think people struggle with capitalism. But I think if you see capitalism in the, in the view of win-win relationships, where you help people and then they help you, um, then I think from a moral perspective, I would hope that people would begin to see it much differently. But when this guy that was bagging on capitalism because Fry's closed down, I'm thinking, man, capitalism is what allowed Fry's to exist and all those wonderful products that are sold through Fry's. And capitalism has allowed a lot more retailers to come forward and compete with Fry's and in many ways do it better. So, you know, in the end, your life is yours. Your life is yours to live. And if we're living in a society, in an environment where you can really live your life according to your own values, capitalism is the economic and some might say political system that allows for that to happen. And so, you know, it's in, in some areas of our society right now, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's trendy to, to bag on capitalism um, and to embrace either socialism or democratic socialism. Um, I just don't think people truly understand what capitalism is really all about. And it's, it's all about, yeah, it's pursuit of your own happiness. It's consistent with our individual rights, and it's ultimately win-win. Um, and that's why you'll see in nations, to the degree that they embrace capitalism, embrace free markets, embrace essentially property rights and freedom, you're, to, to, the, to the degree that they embrace those, there's greater prosperity. And the, and the countries that do the opposite will typically have far less prosperity to the degree that they embrace the opposite of liberty and property rights and essentially capitalism. So, um, it, it, you know, is a, again, I'm kind of going here an hour and 20, but I just want to make a few more points here. Um, people sometimes, I, I hear, I've heard comments like this from a good friend of mine that was just Thinks, they think of profit as some kind of an evil thing. Like they'll say, well, health insurance shouldn't be profitable. And the utility companies, oh my God, those utility companies in Texas are screwing people over and they're doing it for profit and they're greedy. Those people are greedy and we can't have profit in healthcare, no profit in health insurance, no profit in utilities. And they'll go on and on like profit is some kind of an evil thing. It's not. When businesses effectively do what they're supposed to do, they are providing a product or service that benefits the lives of their customers. And, and in return, they get revenue. And the more and more they do it, the better they do it, they earn more and more revenue, and ultimately their business becomes profitable. In my view, when businesses act ethically and they are not trying to rig the system or block competitors like monopolies do, like state-run monopolies do, or they're not trying to use regulations to block competitors or make it difficult for companies to enter the marketplace. When they're doing it truly in a competitive environment, profit is a reflection of value. Profit shows that they are satisfying lots of customers, making customers very happy to the point they want to keep buying over and over from them. So like my company, HelloFresh, that we buy from, that we really love, that delivers food and ingredients and recipes right to our doorstep, literally right on our front door, I hope they're really profitable. I hope they make a ton of money because they make my life better for me and my family. So it, it's just the whole notion of profit, it's not a bad thing. And then look at Best Buy. Best Buy was able to adapt to the economy. They had um, They did curbside pickup. They did online during COVID, they handled it brilliantly and they had their most profitable quarter in 25 years. So that's, you know, profit is a reflection of doing it right and doing a good job. Pat Johnson says, remember there is a thin line between capitalism and greed. Well, you know, it's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of paraphrase Milton Friedman who's an economist. Um, a great man, but he used to, he had this one clip from the Donahue show and it was people complaining about greed. And then Milton Friedman said, he goes, well, who is greedy? You know, surely I'm not greedy or you're not greedy. It's always the other guy that's greedy, right? Well, the thing is, is that we're all living our life. We're all pursuing our happiness. We are all pursuing our self-interest. 
And when we pursue our self-interest, yeah, I mean, we're, we're greedy for life. You know, we're, we want to live in an abundant life. We want to live life to the fullest. We want to flourish. We want to be all we can be. Is that greedy? I think it is. Um, but that's not a bad thing. So, you know, it's, again, I think some people see profit as evil. And I think they're the ones that are going to be more likely to, to have major complaints about greed. But when greed is done, when it's done in nefarious ways to rig the system, to block competition, to force people to buy their product, which we saw with eight, the American Healthcare Act, when, when people are forced to, to buy things or whether they're blocked from competition, then, yeah, okay, then we got a problem where profit is being made for nefarious reasons. That's no longer win-win, that's win-lose. And then that's when we have a problem. But again, I, I should do a podcast on greed sometime because one of my the great ones is, remember you know, that, the uh, movie Wall Street? And that was um, uh, Michael Douglas and Charlie Sheen, I think. And remember Michael Douglas gave, he was Gordon Gecko in that movie. And he gave that speech, greed is good. Remember that one? And oh, people will always cite that speech. Like, oh, you're some greedy capitalist. And, and you, know, you probably think greed is good like Gordon Gecko. Well, one of the things that I did is I went back and listened to that speech. And I challenge you to do this. Go on a YouTube, go look at the Gordon Gecko speech, and greed is good, and listen to it. It's like two, two and a half minutes, not very long. Everything he said in that speech is dead on right, dead on perfect except for one thing. He, he um, decried, uh, he, he blamed trade deficits. Now, trade deficits, I've talked about this before. Trade deficits don't matter, okay? That's where China sells us more stuff than we sell China. He, he was complaining about trade deficits. That was just one tiny nugget in that speech. Everything else he said was dead on perfect. And, and that's, a, that's a good podcast that I might do is just to break down that speech because I think it's really powerful. Pat Johnson said, you hit the nail on the head when you said ethical, and there are a lot of companies that are not ethical, and that's true. But in a free market, right, where we have less regulation, other companies can compete, and they can do it better, and then those unethical companies, they suffer the consequences of their, you know, bad business practices. Um, lack of ethics leads to greed, in my opinion. So- Greed is a word that I think it's one of those words where everyone kind of has a slightly different definition. I like to think of pursuing my self-interest, pursuing my rational self-interest, particularly my rational long-term self-interest. You know, I'm in it for me. <laughs> um, that's not a bad thing if you do it right. Um, some people might still say that's greedy. I don't know. I, I, again, I, I might break that down on a future podcast. So. Um, I just want to finally kind of wrap it up with this is, is we're talking about fries, electronics. We're talking about the economy and COVID and businesses starting and businesses going under and capitalism. And I'm just thinking, okay, what can you do? What can you do in your life to make your life better? What are some nuggets I can give you to take away from all of this that we've learned in this podcast? And so the first part of this is, is, is to make sure, especially, you know, if you're older, you can still teach an old dog new tricks. I, 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 I challenge you there. You can still teach an old dog new tricks, but we need to make sure that we are focused on skill development. That is crucial. So, um, you know, if, if you have an opportunity to speak with a young person, always be preaching the fact that they need to build skills, skills that are always in demand, software development, digital marketing, sales. You, 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 you need good salespeople, good account managers that can help bring business to companies. Accounting skills. Maybe you're a good writer, a video um, editor, a video creator, a content creator. People need to have these skills, tangible skills that are always going to be in demand in the marketplace. You know, data mining, customer service. We talked about that in this podcast. It's important that we go about our business focusing on building skills, just like Tiger Woods. We kicked off the podcast with Tiger Woods. He has unbelievable skills in the game of golf, and that's what made him a champion. Focus on skill development. 
And if we're business owners or business people, hire for that. And if you can't hire for it, contract it out to the gig economy, to gig workers. And like I told you, I, I make some of my money that way. I do consulting work for businesses and people will hire me for my skills. And building skills is crucial because when you have those skills that are in demand in the marketplace, in a capitalist marketplace, in a freer economy, you are gonna be better off financially because you're always gonna be in demand. You're gonna be less likely to ever be out of work. Um, you have to specialize. You, you can't, the days of being in a Renaissance man is just, those don't work anymore. You can't be all things to all people. You can't be good at everything. You've got to find those skills that you're really good at and just kick butt in those categories. Like Tiger Woods did, like Steve Jobs has done, like Bill Gates did, like St Jeff Bezos did. They focused on a very narrow set of skills. They got really good at it and they built their businesses on it. Um, and then find that niche that you can really focus on, the category of the industry that you can be really good at. I mean, how many times have you heard people say things like this? Well, you may be a good software developer, but you don't know anything about the healthcare industry. You couldn't possibly do software development in healthcare because you were doing software development in automotive or in aerospace. You don't know a darn thing about, about healthcare. Well, Sometimes that's not really true. I think we know that, but people will still say it all the time. And it makes a good degree of sense in terms of how you build your career. Not only be skillful in the specific things you know how to do, but know how to do them really well in an industry where you begin to build greater reputation, uh, greater referral opportunities, and be able to not be able to apply those skills in a way that can have a transformational positive benefit for the company. I mean, it's one thing to be a really good, you know, financial professional, accountant, controller, but if you understand that business, that particular business model, you know the tricks of the trade and you know ways that you can optimize yourself to be more effective in that space. And then this goes right to what we were talking about with Fry's and with Best Buy and Amazon and everyone else. You need to innovate. And a really great line that I heard from <laughs> Yuri Bolin chiming in, he says, Bill Gates looks like he would make a great Bond villain. You know, Bill Gates, I just wanted a little bit of a tangent on Bill Gates. Now think of Bill Gates, okay, the founder of Microsoft. And, and you know, we can go back like how he didn't invent MS-DOS. He bought it from another company. And, 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 and you know, we, we can complain about Microsoft and how Windows is really based on Apple's user interface, but then Apple is really based on Xerox and a experimental technology that they had in their pa Palo Alto research lab, um, actually research campus, I think, PARC, P-A-R-C. We can bitch and moan about Bill Gates all we want, but people still, when Microsoft was becoming a bigger and bigger company and becoming more and more profitable, how did we think of Microsoft? specifically, how do we think of Bill Gates? We might have thought of him as a villain because he was maybe creating products that weren't good and he was becoming popular and getting more market share. But we might have also been sort of meh about Bill Gates. We might have said, hey, Windows is good, DOS is good, Microsoft Word, Excel, all the things that the innovation that Microsoft's done. But for Bill Gates, we mostly, yeah, he's a rich guy. But we didn't really maybe judge him too much or maybe we had a slightly negative view. But then do you notice how now that he's done with Microsoft and now he's in all these philanthropic causes and, um, and many wonderful things, he's helping provide clean water in Africa and he's been a part of you know, this COVID um, solution now, and he's been giving away his money. And now how do we feel about Bill Gates? A lot of people think Bill Gates is like a saint, not a Bond villain, but a hero in a movie. There's a lot of people that think very highly of Bill Gates now particularly because he's giving away his money, which goes back to the whole moral argument that some people have a capitalism because they have trouble with self-interest. And now that Bill Gates is becoming selfless, now they like him. But when he was self-interested, they either didn't care or they didn't like him. It just, it's just, that's the weird thing. That's why we have difficulty with capitalism because the morality and, and the capitalist, um, you know, the, the capitalist uh, motive, they're, they're at odds. And I think we a lot of people struggle with that. Um, I think we got to get over it because I think capitalism is good. And again, go back and listen to Gordon Gecko's speech. I, I challenge you to do that. Um, 
And uh, so, yeah, innovate, better, cheaper, faster. I remember I heard this. I worked for a dot-com company in 2000, and someone would just say that a lot, better, cheaper, faster. And it's just a great line to always think about in terms of innovation. Always be an innovator. And you don't necessarily have to, when you think of innovators, you don't necessarily have to be like Bill, like Steve Jobs and create the iPhone or be like Netflix and have this amazing streaming service that knocked Blockbuster out of business. You don't have to be a revolutionary when it comes to innovation. You can just do something slightly better, just a little bit better, like how Best Buy was able to adapt to COVID better with curbside pickup, better than what Fry's did. They were able to be better, or in some cases, well, better, cheaper, faster. Best Buy was better and faster, and they may or may not have been cheaper. In some cases, yeah, they matched the competitive price, but better, cheaper, faster is always a great thing to keep in mind when you are innovating. How can you just make your, your product or service just a little bit better, a little bit cheaper, or a little bit faster? And that's all that's really necessary to get a competitive edge in the marketplace. Um, and you know, the, it's that mindset, that mindset of thinking like an entrepreneur. And here on the live stream, Pete Neal said, will Bezos follow the lead? Like, like Bill Gates, will he start giving away his money? I mean, he already is. I mean, Bezos has given away a ton of his money, um, you know, for a variety of philanthropic causes, but because he's the top dog, everyone's going to hate him. <laughs> it's just like when Walmart was the top dog, they hated Walmart. And when McDonald's is the top dog, they hate on McDonald's. Now they're hating on Bezos. Um, but that'll change. It always changes. And I think, you know, Bezos stepped down as CEO He's probably going to spend more of his time doing philanthropy. And I think, yeah, people's view of Bezos will change. Um, but the, to compete in this marketplace and to compete in an evolving marketplace, we have to be nimble of mind. We have to break down those old paradigms, the old way things are done. We have to think with the right mindset as an innovator and as an entrepreneur. And even if you're an employee in a company, having that entrepreneur mindset is critical. Like one of my clients that I work with is an old company, been in San Diego for over a hundred years. They have an established business. They've been doing things their way for the longest time and it's been successful. But now with COVID, they've had to change. They can't simply sell product, you know, in a retail environment. They've now got to be able to do BOPUS, which is what we're trying to implement with my client, buy online, pick up and store. Revolutionary way of changing the way they do business. I'll give my client credit. They're making that shift. I mean, they should have made it a long time ago, but they were kind of slow to adapt. But now they're kind of being pushed into it. In the end, that's a good thing. But companies need to be able to see where the puck is going, like Wayne Gretzky talked about, and be able to have the leadership that doesn't get stuck in the old paradigms. So if you're an employee, one of those companies, you can be the change agent to push for that innovation or go into business for yourself and be that innovator, be that innovator creating your own company like Jeff Bezos, or be that innovator working in the gig economy and contracting your services out to help so many other people and eliminate the middleman and make yourself more money as a consultant than you would as a regular employee. So there's that mindset is critical. And that's why, again, I'm a big supporter of the gig economy because of the mindset that's required to be successful. We can talk about Uber and how much they get paid and are they even making minimum wage? And I mean, there's a whole argument with Uber, but to be a successful Uber driver, you have to be innovative and creative and you've got to figure out ways to respond to customers better, cheaper, faster. In, in the case of Uber, typically it's by faster. Um, you've got to respond to their needs quickly. You've got to be in the locations where you're most likely to you know, get rides where there's less competition, you know, waiting, hanging out at the airport for an hour for a ride probably isn't the best way to do it. There's other ways. That mindset from the gig economy is what can benefit people, not only as an entrepreneur, but that same mindset still applies even as a frontline or middle management person in corporate America. It's that mindset. And that's what's going to push companies to be better or cheaper or faster so that they can compete in the evolving economy. And so they don't get steamrolled like Fry's or like Blockbuster or like Tower Records. So it's that mindset is having that mindset. And that's why in this podcast, I talk a lot about entrepreneurship and why it's so important. 
because we need entrepreneurs, we need innovators to compete. And when they're doing their job effectively, then established businesses have to change. Best Buy needs to, it needs to match competitive prices. They need to change because if they don't change, they die like Fry's did. So it's having that mindset is just so critical. And, and I'll leave it with this. There's so much money flowing through the economy right now, whether it's just the natural, you know, the nature of being in America in a, you know, it's a mixed economy. It's not a capitalist economy because it's got elements of socialism and frankly, fascism and a lot of other isms. Um, it's a mixed economy, but there's enough capitalism in this economy that creates just amazing opportunities. And then, you know, if you're going to look at it from a pragmatics perspective, they they are pumping so much damn money into this economy um, to save it, you know, not only from COVID, but I think in a lot of ways, this economy, in some cases, is like a house of cards. That's why the Federal Reserve is always keeping interest rates so darn artificially low. But the 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 reality is, is that there's, there's going to be another 1.9 trillion tranche of money that's going to come rushing through the economy. There was already tranches that were delivered in 2020. Um, the Federal Reserve is printing money, making loans cheap, making it easier to go into business for yourself. There's so much opportunity out there. And I think with the right mindset, you can do great things. Um, you can take advantage of all the great things capitalism offers so that you might become the next Jeff Bezos or some version of that in your local community. Um, there's a lot that's out there. And, and I just wanna leave you with that, at least an inspirational note that there's so much opportunity that's available to you in the market. So, um, wow, I just, you know, I went for an hour and 40 minutes on a solo podcast. So I'm looking forward to taking a break and having something to drink. But if you like what we're doing here, I mean, ways that you can help me, is, you know, just listen to every episode. I've got them all on my website at John Riley Project. All the videos are on YouTube. You can go on my, um, uh, get all the podcasts, audio podcasts uh, on every popular audio podcast platform. We recently got on Pandora. And then a little while previous, we got onto iHeartRadio. We're on Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts. I mean, we're everywhere. So, Listen to the podcast. If you like what you hear, what you like what's going on, just click on like. You know, like this episode if you like it. Um, follow uh, my my Facebook page, John Riley Project. Subscribe to the YouTube channel for John Riley Project, and click on the little bell, and you get updates. That would be helpful. But the real, the the greatest thing you could do if you want to help me, and what I'm just trying to do is build audience, is um, share this with other friends. Um, share it and just you know either click on the share button in Facebook or tell a friend about it. Um, a lot of times we cover very local content uh, here in the city of Poway. I try to keep a little bit more of a local flavor to it. Um, that's why I was talking about Fry's Electronics and and uh, Murphy Canyon and Carmel Mountain, uh, Best Buy and the Fry's in San Marcos. I try to keep it local, keep it relevant. Um, you know, we need more local content here in San Diego County, and I'm hoping to provide that. And sometimes I get uber local with looking just at my hometown of Poway. And love having candidates like Yuri Bolin and Pete Neal on as guests. Um, love that. And I, I want more guests, by the way. So if you have guests you'd like to recommend, let me know. If you want to be a guest, let me know. Because I love the discussion. It's better than just one guy and a microphone just blabbing the whole time. So, um, And then if you could, uh, leave a rating and a review on iTunes. That would be awesome. Um, five stars if you think we deserve it. Um, that would be really, really helpful. Um, so I've got um, six five-star ratings so far on iTunes. I could always use more, especially if you write a review. This doesn't be a long thing. Just could be one sentence. Could be three sentences. Whatever you feel like, that would be great. That'd be really appreciated. So um, this is episode number 205 of the John Riley Project. And I don't know if you noticed that when I, excuse me, when I number my podcasts, um, I don't just say number one, number two. In fact, I started it with episode number 0001, okay? And then I was eventually at 0010, and then eventually at 00100. Now I'm at 0205, 0205. What that is, that's a challenge. I did that on purpose to challenge myself to do at least 1,000 episodes. Now, most podcasters only do like seven, maybe 10, and they die. They, they run out of steam. 
I'm like 20% of the way to my, my initial goal. I want to do a thousand episodes. So you can help me do that by spreading the word because the more audience we build gives me more enthusiasm and motivation to keep going. Um, and I'm always looking for guests. So um, that always helps me keep it going. So for those of you that are still watching, gosh, we're up to seven right now on the live stream. Thank you for that. A uh, couple more comments. Yuri Boland said, as of late last year, there was one blockbuster left in the world in Bend, Oregon. Really? I didn't know that. Um, I'm surprised. Uh, do they still rent like VHS tapes there? Um, and then uh, Pete Neal says, not to burst your bubble, but the Dow was shooting up today up until 2 p.m. our time. Then it leveled off. You know, yeah, too many people watching the John Riley project. Um, yeah, God, I was talking with my client this morning. And he was telling me about how the baseball card market is just going bananas. And people are making all kinds of money there where there used to be a glut, oversupply of, of cards. And now all these specialty cards, again, with COVID, people have shifted and began working on some of their hobbies. Now that market's exploding. Um, amazing. The things that are going, there's so much opportunity in this marketplace, in the craziest of niches, in the most unusual places, there's wonderful opportunity to make money. And Matthew Brannigan said, you need to do number 9999 and then quit then. So yeah, if I, I'll tell you what, Matthew, if I ever got to podcast in episode number 9,999, I wouldn't quit then. I would do at least one more just to get to five digits. So um, anyways, I've gone on long enough. So thank you very much. I appreciate all your support and interest. And thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. This is episode 205 of, excuse me, 0205 of the John Riley Project. And have a great day, friends. We'll be back at you on Friday. Bye-bye.